The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. He's going to introduce me first, I think. Is that, we're at four? I think it's that time. Yeah, all right. Hey everyone, this is uh, Deb Nicholson, Chief Community Outreach Director at Open Invention Network and the Community Manager for Media Goblin. She's going to be speaking about shared resources for promoting innovation and what you can do regarding software patents. So, please welcome. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so, uh, just a little background on me. I, I, uh, I'm a free software activist. I got here kind of via the uh, work to promote free speech and uh, increase access to the political process and protect civil liberties. Um, and so, uh, working in that space, I, I had this idea that we're probably missing out on some things that were going on in technology. And when I discovered the free software movement, I was like, aha, that was it. So um, I, uh, I confirmed what I kind of had already suspected, that um, too few choices are really bad for our society in general, but uh, in specific operating systems are no exception. So, uh, so now, I, as he said, I'm working uh, at Media Goblin and the Open Invention Network. So, um, oh, and I, we're a small group, so if you guys have questions in the middle or things you want to clarify, uh, we can be really casual and then just raise your hand. Um, so the Open Invention Network is uh, a defensive patent pool for uh, Linux, both on the desktop, like the GNU Linux user space, and then also the, uh, on the mobile, on mobile devices. So. Um, what we have is a defensive patent pool. Everyone who's part of the pool uh, agrees to mutual non-aggression on uh, Linux and related technology that's with, you know, within the purview. Um, we also uh, do some work to block bad software patents by encouraging people to file defensive publications and to create prior art. Uh, and we will often give free advice to uh, Linux projects and uh, you know, with the regards to like patents and other kinds of issues that are similar. So, uh, so that's what the Open Invention Network is. Um, we're actually based out of Raleigh, although I work at my house in Cambridge. So there we go. Uh, so just, I think probably everyone agrees with me on this one. Like, you're all here spending your Saturday at a Linux Fest because you believe that free software is important. Is that everybody, does that describe everybody here? Okay, great. <laughs> huh? Oh. <laughs> uh, it's like a bridge to a hazy future we can't see yet. My, um, I, I went to school for painting and sculpting, so like I'm more of a, a like a visual person. I'm gonna try not to like read off the slide because I think that isn't that interesting. Because then, you, like it, then you could just read along with me, and, and so I don't you know need to be here. So. <laughs> so, um, so some of the, some of the reasons that I think free software is really critical for our future is, you know, it, it helps uh, developing countries with minority language groups to be able to participate in technology. So, like Brazil is a great example. Um, you know, uh, there's there's free software written in uh, the Basque language, which is like a tiny, tiny piece. Um, so it's like great for cultural diversity. Uh, it's also really great for small businesses. So there's a lot of really great small business software that is completely free. So like if you have a veterinarian's office, like someone has already written some kick-ass software for that. Um, I think also dentists, like a very small dental practice, you can get great software. So like, like a massive, massive installation doesn't work for maybe your four-person business, uh, but you can take something that's free and tailor it specifically to your need and have a one, you know, not, not a one size fits all solution, but like one just specifically for you. So I think it's good because then, you know, um, we're able to support and empower like small businesses and that we wouldn't otherwise be doing. So, so that's a little bit why I think it's important. Um, probably everyone agrees with me on this part too, right? <laughs> um, 
So according to a recent paper by James Besson at Boston University, he wrote, uh, we find that NPE, and that's non-practicing entities or patent trolls, um, we find that NPE lawsuits are associated with half trillion dollars of lost wealth to the defendants from 1990 to 2010. So during the last four years, uh, the lost wealth has averaged over 80 billion per year. And these defendants are mostly technology companies who invest heavily in R&D. Um, so that's a lot of money. So uh, getting sued, you know, it costs money. And I think that the time could always be better spent on the part of the technology company, unless, of course, you're the $400 an hour lawyer. Um, it's, you know, it's good to be the king. Um, and, uh, but I also think humanity's time could be better spent. So like in that kind of big picture uh, sense, when I think of like, you know, we could send people to the moon, we could, you know, write software to help people with disabilities to participate more fully, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in the, the internet and such. And so we could do like a million things, you know, um, maybe not time travel, but you know, humanity's time could definitely be better spent than um, the giant suck of resources and time that goes into patent troll suits. Um, also, frivolous lawsuits, uh, like the patents, patent troll suits, tend to um, deter innovation. So uh, a company that's being sued often sees its stock prices plummet, and uh, it has a huge impact on morale. So suddenly, like, you thought you are working for your, your company on your stuff, and now you're, pour, you're, you're possibly going to be, you know, the fruits of your labor are going to be poured into some other company that just chose to sue you. So, um, so it, it also it makes people kind of uh, avoid certain areas. So, like, MPEG LA, is, uh, that's all of the video patents, and they've put out their, like, if you're doing anything in video, you're definitely violating a patent we have, which we're not going to let you see or get real specific about, but you can pay us. It's kind of like an old school, like, you know, fuck you, pay me. Um, and so, like, then people end up uh, avoiding, like, whole areas. And so that's definitely bad for innovation. And the, the goal, the original goal of patents in the U.S. system is that they're supposed to encourage innovation, which was, like, a great idea if you were, you know, like, um, horse and buggy days where it's like, oh, well, I got to, you know, get on my horse and buggy and go borrow money from like 15 people that live, you know, hundreds of miles away and then invest in my great idea. So if you can give me like two years to like make that happen, which is not the way that stuff works now, obviously, in tech. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. We'll get to the, <laughs> again. The choir right here, right? So, <laughs> okay. So, how do you know if you're infringing? I had put a picture of like a patent that uh, I originally was going to put up a picture of a patent that um, got kicked off, like it was um, overturned. And then I was like, what if they found a way to bring it back? And then I would be subjecting everyone who'd seen that slide to trouble damages, and I didn't want to do that. So, you now we get a nice fuzzy blue sky. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's 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 pretty difficult. Um, so this, this particular patent was a win. Do people know what this one is? Like this, this is just the title. Um, this was, um, so it's Red Hat and Novell in 2007 were uh, sued by an NPE um, for user interface with multiple workspaces for sharing display system objects. Um, and there was like three patents with this under this title. Um, this is X Windows from 1987. So it was Xerox Park patent that um, somebody bought up when they divested all their stuff. And um, so 1987, and then in 2007, they finally were like, "Hey, it looks like you guys are using some display system objects." So. Uh, so these are the kinds of suits that we're talking about. Um, IP Innovations, the company that brought this suit, uh, is not going to be able to bug you about this one anymore. Like the three junk patents on this, uh, with this title, were knocked out. We hope, <laughs> um, but of course the suit still costs a lot of money, and you know so that's that's pretty crap. Um, it's a uh, yeah. I um I actually had went into like the patent because I, I I mostly don't uh, write code. Um, so I actually looked at the patent site, like the U.S. patent site, where you're supposed to go and be like, oh, I wonder if someone already came up with my awesome banana carrier idea or whatever, and you're supposed to search in there. And so like, I searched around for like display system objects, and um, 
the number of things that you got for like display system objects just just titled that it was like thousands and it was crazy and you know and they were all like and uh, so even you know and so even assuming that the person who had invented invented something else um, had actually named it what you think it ought to have been named as well. Like you guys were in like one mind on what that should be called. You would still have to go through like tons of stuff. Um, also, I'm not sure if this is intentional or they just have like super uh, low resources, but it was like the slowest page in the whole world to load. And you got like 10 patents at once. And it wasn't like a fancy page. It was like, it was like a text like only. Like, and, and then just like 10 links to patents would load up. And it was like, zzz, you know. So, um, so I'm not suggesting that you search the patent database because of the trouble damages that I mentioned before where you, get, where you pay more if you're willfully infringing than if you're not um, knowledgeable and, or just accidentally infringing. Uh, although there was maybe uh, some inference that willfully being uh, unknowledgeable might make you uh, like a willful infringer. I, so I know it's, it's, um, it's a, <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. We can all drop some acid later and it will totally make sense. No, I, I, we're not going to do that. But, um, and it still might not make sense. Yeah. So, um, so I'm going to go over a little bit of like how we got here. So this is like the um, this is the 10 cent tour through um, patent um, legislation, or I'm sorry, litigation. So the 1952 amendment to the Patent Act, um, they added the word process to the list of what is patentable. This is just in the U.S. The U.K. and um, and other systems work a little bit differently, although a lot of companies that have patents in software arena choose to litigate on them in the U.S. because of the way that our system works, in particular West Texas. So, um, so they added the word process to the list of what is patentable in 1952, um, and they were definitely talking about industrial processes at that point and not software, just so we're clear. Uh, the next case, uh, Gottschalk versus Benson, um, they decided that math is not patentable. So there was, um, it was like a combination of things, and the court said pretty firmly that they felt that algorithms should not be patentable. And uh, that, that kind of, you know, that got chiseled away, as we'll see in the next couple of slides. Um, then the next piece was uh, Parker versus Fluke, and um, they said that mathematical algorithms are patentable if the implementation is novel and non-obvious. So if you just are patenting the algorithm, you can't have it. But if you're implementing it in a way that is novel and non-obvious, then you can have a patent. And this suit was about whether, um, or not having an alarm or some kind of a trigger to signal a catalytic converter, uh, that, like when it's operating outside certain desirable parameters, um, ought to be patentable. And so in the end, the algorithm wasn't patented, but the application of the algorithm was. So like, if you, I mean, there's really no point in having an algorithm that you don't apply to anything, because then they're just hanging out. But So you can see this is a little bit of like, to find what is is, you know, kind of a thing. So, um, the next one, diamond versus deer, and this is uh, about a physical process controlled by a program. So the combination of the two elements, uh, they decided is patentable. And this case was about um, software that was being used to control the process of curing rubber, um, like for tires and stuff. So, which is apparently pretty tricky, but um, that's. Uh, but they decided that. Um, that the, again, the application of the algorithm um, in the device was what made it novel and non-obvious and then patentable. So um, the, next, uh, the next one was the uh, Federal Circuit Court. Well, this is not a case. This is, uh, the Federal Circuit Court was set up to hear appeals on software cases. Um, I'm sorry, yeah, on software cases. And um, so these, sorry, patent cases, but also software patent cases. These courts were largely presided over by patent attorneys, and this is um, the case law that was created here um, ended up being the road to the patentability of everything. 
um, including software. So, and the lower courts in the U.S. have to abide by the higher courts precedent. And uh, the idea here was that, like, oh, we'll have people who are experts in patents deal with all the patent cases, and then the experts that they found were, of course, patent attorneys some of whom were, had been made very wealthy by the enforcement of patents and felt very, you know, as warm and fuzzy as anyone feels about a giant pile of money towards patents. So um, basically they put a cookie monster in charge of the cookie jar here. So um, uh, Alpat, they decided that the installation of software on a device creates a new patentable machine. So you can see uh, we're, we're spinning wildly out of control into silly land here. Um, this one was uh, derided as the piano roll blues by one of the dissenting judges. He said, like, a piano, like a player piano is the same no matter which roll of song you put on there. I'm a little fuzzy on how piano, player pianos work, but, uh, but it's basically like, it's the same thing, whatever kind of, you know, info you put on it. And they were like, no, 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 it, it could be, it could be new. Um, and then uh, the 1998 State Street case um, is where we get the useful, concrete, and tangible document, uh, doctrine. And that was, um, it was about an, a business method patent from, um, and, they, and there's like, they were looking at a business method patent in this one, and they wanted to uh, apply the useful, concrete, and tangible. So not useful, concrete, or tangible, but like they were like, maybe patentability ought to be like all three of these things. That didn't last. That was struck down, um, as <laughs> you guys are probably aware. And then, um, then we had a big, long gap of time where the Supreme Court chose not to hear anything about patents and, or software patents at all. Like They didn't really want to get into it until 2010 when they um, decided to hear Bilski versus Kapos. And this is another business method patent. This is about hedging risk, um, which is like, oh, save some for a rainy day kind of a thing. So that's like a really vague idea, but they put a lot of financial language words in there and it made it sound like kind of a big deal. Um, a lot of folks had high hopes for this. When I was working at the FSF, we were organizing to um, put uh, an amicus brief together and get a lot of folks to sign on. People were like, please use this to strike down software patents. Please use this to get rid of business method patents. And we probably even got folks like talking about genetics and other like, you know, law and nature things. Um, and so uh, there were like people were really excited, like, yay, the Supreme Court finally is going to hear something. Maybe they will finally make something, you know, change this. Um, they didn't. And this is exactly what Judge Stevens said. He said, if a high enough bar is not set when considering patent applications of this sort, patent examiners and courts could be flooded with claims that would put a chill on creative endeavor and dynamic change. If. So this. Um, uh, this is from Judge Stevens, and this is this is where the Supreme Court is at on, was at on in 2010. So they're like, "What problem? Well, let us know if there's a problem, and then we'll do something about it." And so um, I'm not, I don't know, maybe maybe we should send them like a slash dot login free. Come on, check it out. Um, but uh, yeah, so that didn't work out. Um, not the movie. I, this is not a spoiler. So um, this. Uh, we're still kind of trying to sort out what this one means. Uh, the, the actual Prometheus case is good. This is like, but it's not about software, unfortunately. But it is about patents. So um, Prometheus uh, sued um, Mayo Clinic. So Prometheus Laboratories is like a pharmaceutical company. And they had this, um, their brilliant idea was like, step one, put a drug in the patient. Step two, measure it with this like range uh, that we decided is the range, and then step three, decide whether or not to adjust the dosage. And, and that was the patent. I'm, I'm stripping out a lot of the pharmaceutical, huh? Isn't that pretty much normal for a hydration? Yes, that, and, um, and so that is actually what the Supreme Court decided. They, uh, they said that, uh, so this, this is a win because they said um, you're patenting a natural phenomena, like measuring the level of something in people's blood is like just, you know, the, they're just people still, you can't patent them. And then they also said that um, it's the part, like the step two where like you, or I'm sorry, the step three where you then adjust the dosage is like a thing that doctors do all the time and is pretty obvious. It's, it's a, like, this was, this was in courts for like maybe like three weeks. <laughs> So it was like some group of people that are like, like normal for them for three weeks was getting up and listening to like, 
you know, like, well, you know, we discovered this, like, amazing range for this autoimmune drug, and, you know, it's like it, we spent a lot of money, blah, blah, blah. So, um, so this one, you know, so for the pharmaceutical uh, industry, this is, um, well, for the pharmaceutical industry, this is bad news. For patients, this is good news. For people that are opposed to the patentability of everything under the sun, this is also good news. Um, so that range is actually some mathy algorithm stuff, and so people think that perhaps, perhaps, the courts will turn around and um, say, like, oh, that one has an algorithm and this one has an algorithm. We should get rid of all the algorithm ones. I think that's unlikely to happen, although it is a nice thing to think about for a minute. Like, we could pretend, maybe, maybe. No, it's, I'm sorry, it's probably not. Um, there's already a lot of stuff like, oh, wait till those West Texas guys get a hold of this and can figure out a way to like carve out all the nooks and crannies around this, you know, stupid decision, right? So like, you know, case law is complicated. There are a lot of cases, but um, for uh, for people that have Crohn's disease, um, their doctors can now, without paying Prometheus a giant fee, adjust their dosage outside of the toxic range for them. So. If you know anyone who has Crohn's disease, yay, this is a win. Um, so, um, so this is uh, some of the patent publications held by a few of the most active collectors in the US. Uh, this one, um, Acacia, this is one of their subsidiaries is IP Innovations, and they brought that X Windows suit that we talked about a little bit, like a couple slides ago. Um, there's also been like some uh, speculation that they have some weird ties to Microsoft because IP Innovations, um, or I'm sorry, like, yeah, they, they hired a couple of folks that used to work at Microsoft. So like, there's no like real paper trail there. I don't know, it's, it's, it's a little bit fuzzy, but it is interesting to note and that like, you know, IP Innovations took on Red Hat and Novell with like, you know, I don't know, maybe they drank the Kool-Aid and they really do think like that open source shit is the scourge of the universe or something. But, um, huh? Yeah, see, that's the thing where it's like, maybe they just got a taste of the suing and just like it now. So I don't know, it's hard to say. That's why I'm saying it's like a speculative, you know, we don't really know. Yeah. Oh, this is, yeah, the, this is from Patent Freedom, and so um, their numbers, they're maybe like a year or two old, so um, the load says numbers I don't have. But um, yeah, Patent Freedom is a great site if you want to be depressed, but, um, <laughs> and have numbers to back it up. So <laughs> you can take a look at that. Um, and so, like, so, so all of these companies, um, this is what they make. Um, I don't actually know that they make rubber band balls. I only assume that anyone with a desk and employees, you know, sitting at desks makes rubber band balls. Um, the, so, like, Intellectual Ventures has 10 offices and 700 employees. So, I, I, I'm betting there's at least a couple of rubber band balls there. Uh, the money, of course, is not to scale. Uh, that's a single coin. It came out a little blurry this time around. Um, let's take a look at the money. Um, so 14 uh, NPEs uh, raked in a combined 7.6 billion over 10 years, and that uh, represents only about 9% of what the companies who were sued actually lost. So the defendants lost an, an estimated 87.6 billion. So this is, um, this is, this is companies that uh, are employing developers and are employing designers and uh, they, like, like I said, the stock price goes down, so some of this is like projected revenue. Um, injunctions happen and they have to stop shipping a product, so like that's, that projected revenue is also included here. Um, and then, and you know, let's not forget that attorneys must also be paid uh, out of this pile. So uh, basically 14 companies, they uh, sent notes and got $7.6 billion but they deprived the software industry of $87.6 billion. So, um, so one, of the, uh, one of the things that people kind of like to imagine, like, oh, it can't be all that bad. Like, one company sues another, and then they make the product, and we all get the gain. And it's, no, they don't. Um, and the revenue doesn't happen, and the, the product doesn't ship. And so, um, and, and, and this is the, the, the ratio. Like, they're sponging it off, and then 91% of that potential revenue is on the floor. So just gone. Okay. 
So that's, um, that's grim, right? Uh, so, in addition to the money, there are also other problems. Um, the threat of software patents impacts standards. Um, it dictates what's get pack what gets packaged, it creates extra work, uh, and it ends up making the user experience less than ideal. Like, um, how many times have you guys tried to get a friend to use free software, and then they're like, how come it doesn't do the, you know, fill in the blank, whatever thing, or actually literal fill in the blank, like autofill on calc or something? And they're like, oh. Because you were like, I'm going to show you a sparkly unicorn. And it's like, um, this one uh, is going to grow a torn back soon. Sorry. So, uh, you know, so there's that. Um, Apple has suggested that Theora, the video standard, might be patent encumbered. Might be. It definitely slowed enthusiasm for um, adoption of that format. Uh, like I said, MPEG LA has implied that all video standards are in violation of their patents. So, you know, you can't do anything with them. They, they, yeah, who knows? They have a lot of patents, so, um, you know, it's, it's very possible. Uh, they license usage of their patents for money, like I said. Um, uh, Fedora excludes playback of encrypted DVDs in their out-of-the-box install uh, just to be safe. So, you know, so if you're like, how come we can't watch movies on your machine? Like, mm, patents, that's why. Um, uh, so for years, uh, patent concerns made cron like had made uh, fonts look really crummy on Linux distributions. Do you guys remember like the true type fonts uh, patent, and then uh, also, but uh, you know, so now they look a little better. But um, they we still have to work around uh, the clear type technology. This is a Microsoft uh, product for sub pixel rendering. So like, there's some stuff you can download, but it doesn't come shipped with it. So you have to go looking for it and. I looked at it and it was a little beyond my eye. I was like, eh. <laughs> so these are unrendered subpixels. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and Red Hat had to remove the autofill from their version of Calc. Uh, and then patent fear can also cause projects to do a lot of extra work. So like the TomTom -Tom suit where Microsoft had sued the GPS folks for um, the file allocation table patents in the Linux kernel, which is the, in case people don't know what the super magic invention there is, Sometimes you have a short name, a short version of the name, and sometimes you have a long version of the name, and you have them, you know, in a table. Um, so that was in, that's in the Linux kernel, and so like a whole bunch of kernel developers. I don't know how many kernel developers there are in the world. Um, I expect it's a finite number, and that they could probably be doing something better with their time. Uh, but they all, you know, we had to have folks work on the Linux kernel and make sure that they were skirting very carefully the file allocation table patent. So um, there's also like some stuff just gets like, you know, is is just wiped out of existence. There's a guy who works on. Um, GIMP, like he was, he was doing little plugins for GIMP just in his spare time for fun, like this guy in Germany. And like someone at Borland, I don't know if it was like new guy in the IP department was like, oh, let's see if we can monetize some of this stuff. So he got a letter and he was like, I'm just a guy that works on this stuff in my spare time. Like, screw that noise. And so like he deleted it and then eventually had to put up a note saying like, please stop asking me for the GIMP plugins. I'm never putting them back. I got a note from Borland. I am in no way, shape or form willing to get sued over this. Like they are gone. Like stop asking. So they're just gone. Uh, uh, well, yeah, probably, probably. It's, <laughs> it could be, yeah. It's a, maybe you could go in the way back machine and find it or something. What's that? Oh, oh, well, it's probably to match GIMP. I, I, I don't know. What's it? Yes, it would be GPL. Yeah, but it would be it would be two. This was a couple years ago. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. If you find them, you could fork them, and then you might get a note from Borland. But you know, don't tell them, Don't say I didn't warn you. <laughs> Those plugins. Uh huh. I don't smack people, just, just, just so you know. If all of the so-called intellectual property that is uh, rights are, it's transferred to the end user. Mm -hmm. Isn't that the whole, like, the whole so thing? Video is public, right? like, so oh, yeah, let me do a little bit of background. Yeah. So GPL v2 doesn't mention software patents at all. Um, and the GPL works 
primarily under copyright law. So copyright law is designed for like songs and music and books and poems and all that jazz. Um, and then patents are for like ideas or concepts or whatever. Yeah, well now it is, right, yeah. Or like it's supposed to be for inventions. So, um, right, so but if you have like, uh, like a functionality that um, you figured out another way to achieve, um, that, could st that could still be patent infringement if someone has a patent on that functionality, whereas copyright infringement is when you have like wholesale cut and paste. So, you know, so th th people kind of get that, like trademarks totally separate, blah, blah. So, um, huh? Right. It, is, it was designed more for like creative works. Um, none of the current like IP tools uh, were designed with software in mind. And so, you know, it's a, you end up with a clunky fit. Copyright? It is a written work by people, yeah. OK. So, um, so there are some things that can be done. And that's, we're going to go on that bit, and then I'll open it up for questions. Um, so uh, peer to patent, uh, this is like at, at linuxdefenders.org. Um, we're working on gathering background for the USPTO to look at before bad patents are issued. So um, one of the reasons that the quality of current pat well, we think one of the reasons that the quality of current patents is so bad is because the USPTO is sort of chronically understaffed. Uh, and the amount of time that they can spend examining a single patent is pretty short. And then they're not necessarily experts in that area. They might be like, look, like oh, you work in the software department, but uh, they, you know, Obviously, software is vast, and so you know they may not be a particular expert in that section. Um, I actually I met someone who was a um, who worked specifically in the umbrella department. So like her whole day was looking at patents for new umbrellas, and and sometimes other rain gear. So like they they tried to like. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, like, or like, how do you guys remember those hats that was like had an umbrella on? Yeah, so like that kind of thing she said. So, so for some stuff, you can be really expert, and then for like the software department, it's, it's a little too broad. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's. Um, I think it's like the banana carrier where people constantly like, you know, because they carry one all the time, they're like, I could totally do a better job on this. You know, and because it's like one of those things, like yeah, there's there's some stuff that there's a lot of patents on. People are constantly improving, and it's like like it's. I don't know. If you're thinking of of inventing one, don't go looking though, because you don't want to, you know, be a willful infringer. Um, <laughs> so you know, anyway. Um, so uh, OAN is the lead sponsor of the Linux Defenders program. Um, and so uh, the prior art documentation is, um, is, a, is a big thing to help us uh, get rid of existing bad patents. Um, and it's, uh, you know, so like when, um, when Red Hat and Novell were sued, we did a, like kind of crowdsourced prior art and we're like, hey, we must know the people who were on all those Usenix lists in 1986 before this Xerox Park patent was issued. If you can dig up some of those uh, old archives and find something, that would be super awesome. And so that was one of the ways that those patents were dumped is that someone was like, oh yeah, I totally have my Usenix list stuff from 1986. So, um, so that was actually really good. You, 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 you might find, you might think that person is a little OCD, but it was helpful. So, um, it's, that's really good. Another way that um, we can uh, block future bad patents is with defensive publication. So if you don't want to like get into the game of patenting something yourself, you can say like, I or my company or my project made this thing and we don't want anyone to patent it. So, uh, that's basically what a defensive publication is. And OIN helps people write those if they want to. Um, and I can talk. Does that still work with the recent like the first to file versus first to invent. So like um, you file a defensive publication. So yeah. And then the prior art actually helps more with the um, novel, non-obvious piece of patentability. So um, 
if you, you, you can't say like, we both got this at the same, like exact same thing at the exact same time, and then it's still, it still comes down to first to file. But if there's a lot of prior art where it's like, you know, seriously, everyone's been using this for three years, then it's like, it's not novel and non-obvious. So that's, uh, yeah, uh, the America Invents Act is a um, piece of legislation that was recently passed that changed us, uh, the US system, uh, so that it's more in line with the global system. So like in most companies, we used to have like a first to invent. So if you're like, I invented it, but you didn't tell anyone or do anything, but you could at least document it, then um, you couldn't be sued for infringement if somebody else filed on it later. But now if you just secretly invent it and don't have any, you know, then you're first to, you, I'm sorry, what? Submarine. Well, so the submarine patent thing is where someone's been hanging on. Oh, I'm sorry. So he, the question is, is that about the submarine patents? Um, a submarine patent, in my understanding, is more when uh, someone's been holding on to like a patent for a really long time. Yeah, they or they bought it off of someone else that you know declared bankruptcy or something. Um, and so, yeah, if they have like one of those super old things, and yeah then you it would still, that's the first to file. So you have, you, you get to keep the date with it, is my understanding. But yeah, if you, if you have a specific, like, I'm not, I'm not an attorney, so if you're like asking, because you're like, oh sweet, I'm gonna go back to my company and tell them that we're totally good on whatever, like, don't do that. Um, send me a note if you need like that kind of specific, like, don't, don't try and catch free legal advice out of me, is what I'm saying. <laughs> huh? He's also not an attorney, but he would be happy to talk to you about stuff too. <laughs> no, he, uh, like, di different things, so anyway. Um, so the, uh, as I said, um, OAN has, uh, has a patent pool. Um, there are a lot of other patent pools, and some of them behave like the mob, like in Pig LA, um, and some of them are like for other specific pieces of industry. There's probably some pharmaceutical pools and things like that. Um, OAN is the only defensive patent pool dedicated to the pres preservation of Linux. So um, this one is ours, and um, it's free to become an OAN number. I can talk to people more about that in specific, or we can convince about patents, whatever. Um, I, uh, yeah, and so I think, uh, summing up, I, sadly, I think the courts are unlikely to do anything super great in the realm of putting patents outside the scope of you know, I'm putting software patents outside the scope of patentability. I also don't think the legislature is going to do it. They feel like sort of, oh, we just dealt with all the, you know, patent stuff with the America Invents Act, and I don't know about your, um, your Congress people, but when I talk to them about tech, I get the feeling they're not too savvy. I also get the feeling they're not too savvy on patents. So, um, or they don't care. They uh, never underestimate like the um, motivation to be unsavvy that a lot of money can produce. Um, it's uh, sad but true. I went over to Europe earlier this year, and they were like, you know, I, I, and they're like, I know you're just the messenger, but like, why are you guys so screwed up about this stuff? And I was like, eh, money, <laughs> some is part of it, and yeah, so. Um, I mean, the, the district in Texas that uh, does all these cases, they're very tied up, and it's, it's like a whole industry. Like, um, you know, they're very invested in continuing the system, and the, the, all the companies that employ patent attorneys and get their advice on um, patents from those attorneys, those people are very invested in them continuing to, like, you know, play that game as well. So, like, the, like, the thing is, is that there isn't, uh, there isn't the motivation in that way to, you know, uh, to see that like complete abolition of software patents um, yet. I mean, you know, you guys, whatever, or maybe it's Stephen Colbert to fund it. Who knows? That's the that's the idea I kick around with Bradley Kuhn is that we'll get Stephen Colbert to, <laughs> to form a super PAC. Um, if anyone knows him personally, let me know. Um, Okay, and so I'm going to open it up for uh, questions, comments, et cetera, um, on any aspect of that. These are just, that's my email at the Open Invention Network, and then uh, those are just the picture credits. So they're all, yes? So you, uh, in regards to the Open Invention Network, you mentioned yeah. specifically a couple of times. Yeah. I'm wondering what the focus is on Linux specifically. Yeah. 
Yeah. Right. So, um, so the open invention network was uh, the question is why does the uh, OAN's defensive patent pool focus specifically on Linux and not on the general open source or general free software? So I think it comes out of the six founding um, companies that started OAN and that they're like specifically interested in Linux. So it's like it's Red Hat, it's Novell, it's IBM, um, Sony, Philips, and I'm always forgetting the other ones. There's one more. NEC. Oh, so we're not, and I know, like, I, I do mean GNU Linux on the desktop, but it's like, it's Linux on the desktop and in the mobile space. So, um, so both of those things. Um, and then a lot of the functionality that works on top of that, so like the office suite and everything is also in there. Um, I think it's more a thing of like, what can we get everybody to agree to and let's at least get started on that. Uh, we did recently update the Linux system definition to include some more developer tools so that like the things that people typically have on their machine and are using to create more software that is in that space. Um, it hasn't gone full blown out to like every piece of free software on the planet. I don't know if that's going to happen because it's it, the, the, when it gets fuzzier around the edges like a lot of our companies and members have um, interest in other areas and they you know the departments that work on the Linux stuff are like, yeah, awesome, let's do this non-aggression thing. So we're, we are pretty tightly focused in that way. Um, you know, it, but if you have specific suggestions for specific packages or specific areas, um, we're gonna be updating what's included going forward. So like, obviously, like from my perspective, the more things that we could get everybody to agree to, the better, but it's, you know. So, so it's defined by a specific group of projects? Yeah. Yeah, and that's an um, yeah, and that's on our website, uh, openinventionnetwork.com. So I can you know you can search for specific stuff. Does that does that answer the question? It's still a little fuzzy to me. I mean, I don't have to go in here myself. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's well. I mean, and the thing is, is like part of the, I think part of why it works is because of the the focus, you know. And so it's you know it's it's difficult, like when you know people want to do everything, but. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Yeah. That's not how it's set up. So the question is, um, uh, could we see like more of a like what full on community participation model instead of like a, you know a, a leadership led sort of yeah well we are going to be soliciting more um, feedback and so like it's some of the some of our members are a little old school so they're like we don't want the whole rabble coming in it's like it, you know and it's like okay okay let's 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 start so. It's, it's definitely going more towards more um, input and participation. I don't think it's going to be like a full-on like, you know, hippie collective by this time next year. But not, not that I think that's a bad thing. They're great. Um, but uh, so, you know, it's a process is what I'm saying. So do people have other questions, comments? Here and then. Oh, I'll, you and then I'll go over to Glenn. So go ahead. That is, so that is, let's get, let's solicit um, the idea, okay, so, oh, sorry, I keep forgetting to repeat the question, so. Um, the question is, is uh, Linux defenders trying to get rid of software patents or just limit damage? And I'd say primarily to limit damage. It's, uh, again, it's a pretty tightly focused thing where uh, it's like, wow, the USPTO doesn't seem to have any idea like what's going on in a lot of these fields and we would really like for them to, you know, understand what's happening and stop like issuing like multiple patents on the same stuff just because you used a different term or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's to try and get like redundant and vague and um, non, non novel stuff from being patents. So, yeah. 
So that's that's what that's what Linux Defenders is doing. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Glenn. Right. So the the question is uh, is are are patent trolls like intellectual ventures actually making money? Um, uh, given that uh, it's twelve billion in capital and they've pulled in four billion, is a, is the number you saw? Yeah. Well, intellectual ventures we know is a subsidiary of Acacia. Um, so I, I like so they might. Um, I mean, who knows? They could be doing like a shell game where they are reporting a loss on like, oh, all the poor employees at Intellectual Ventures are not making very much money, but Acacia like somehow got like $8 billion in fees from them. Who knows? Like, so, because uh, a lot of them are like, it's like, uh, and if you saw that this American Life thing, then you know how cagey it is. Like, you go to their address and nobody's there, and like, you try and follow, like, so wait, this one's in a, a subsidiary, this one, and then this one is a subsidiary here, and then like, they finally go to that building where like, there's a couple different doors with all different, um, you know, company names on them, but nobody's there, and there's a big stack of junk mail in front of the door. So yeah, I don't know. Like, um, it would be it would be great to know more about like why that works. I mean, there's stuff, I don't know. I think there's a lot of stuff that we're never going to understand, like why does edible arrangements make money or, you know, this is <laughs> like, it's, who knows? So the yeah so right so the the comment is that um, some of the companies that are bringing software patent suits are not doing it to make money but doing it to thwart their competition and that is definitely true there was like a Intel and Cirix case from a while ago you see it was very clear Cirix was smaller and you know the six month. Uh, hassle of trying to figure out like who did what like while Cirrus wasn't allowed to ship gave Intel enough time to go and get their own product put together and then just blow them out of the water because they had much superior distribution. So yeah, you definitely see that. Um, uh, PJ on Grok Loss thinks that the uh, case that Microsoft brought against TomTom Tom wasn't at all about like, ooh, we're really going to shake TomTom Tom down for money because like Bill Gates is so hard up for cash. like that it was more like a shot across the bow, like, see that Linux people? We got to, and it's like, Ugh, you know, so, and that's like the point is that, you know, there, a lot of times that's the point. And that was why people were interested in like, why do those former Microsoft employees work at Acacia? Like, or do they actually still work at Microsoft? Again, we'll never know. Like we go to their office and find, you know, riffle through their junk mail, but um, I don't know. Uh, I think, do we know what they are? Uh, I know one of them was the background, what is, or what is the linkage between the background and the web browser? Hmm. Yeah, what do I do with the project part? Another, another one was the uh, using a widget to expand the size of the window, the bottom right corner of the window. 
Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, man. The specter of Xerox continues. Huh. That's an interesting idea. So the question is, can we directly attack with the five patents that we know that Microsoft was lording over Barnes and Noble? And um, I don't know um, that it's possible. I, uh, I, if there is prior art, like I would certainly encourage you to go to Linux Defenders, like especially if you have some, like that would be awesome. Um, the more prior art there is, the more full of resource it is, and then the more you know more likely it is like, oh, we should check that repository, you know, and look on those things. So there's, oh, okay, and then they settled, so, yeah. Did they settle? Well, there would need to be a mechanism. Yeah, so there'd need to be a mechanism. The, the USPTO doesn't do that many challenges of patents like out of nowhere. It's usually because of a lawsuit, um, which is actually why like a lot of um, the lawsuits are such bad news for the free software community because um, if a company that's like in that mid-range doesn't fight, then um, a lot of times like either the company that is actually shipping software or the non-practicing entity will continue to use that stick to beat everybody that they can reach with. So it's, um, so the junk patents keep floating around and getting done again and again. So yeah, there would be, need to be another case, I think, for there to be an overturning. Um, I can double check on that. Like, like I said, I'm not an attorney, but my understanding is that like they don't take solic unsolicited out of the like blue. This one really bugs me. We should get rid of it, kind of things. But if there's an ongoing lawsuit, then you, that's uh, you know a, a, a big well, that's the opportunity or the mechanism to um, kick out a junk patent. Yeah. Yeah, well, if Google doesn't have the wherewithal to fight back um, in the courts, then I don't know if the folks in the room here are going <laughs> to. Oh, 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 right. Okay, so where they went on the. Uh, Well, and especially they're going to spin off a dummy company to do their dirty work. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, there are a lot of cases and it's, it makes it, it makes it really tricky. Like I can't even keep up with them all and I try and read Grok Law all the time. So it's, um, yeah. So there would need to be a case, I think, to kick out those five patents. But, uh, but the other ones, like if the case has already come and gone, then I, I there's, you know, collecting the prior art uh, in advance so that the next time that someone gets sued, we can send them a note and be like, hey, we have a whole pile of prior art. Please don't just like curl up and give them a check. So, um, you know, so I, th I, th I think that's, that's the way that I, I think it would be. There's not a proactive thing unless you want to sue Microsoft over them yourself. <laughs> Which, like, good luck, because that would be super amazing to watch. Right, right, so, you know. Right, and so that would be outside of the Linux stuff, I think. I mean, I don't know what's on the Xbox. I'm not a gamer, so. Huh? No, no, Android, right, because like, yeah, so we include a lot of stuff on the mobile, so it's, yeah. Yeah, so that would be, you know, it would be good to see those dumped. So yeah, if you, if you, if you have some ideas about where that prior art might come from, then definitely load it up and. <laughs>
Right, so uh, we have, right, right, so yeah, and there's like a list more, like a more specific list of what's, what's covered in Linux system definition and what, you know, what the exact resources are, so. Yeah, and that sounds like, yeah, that sounds like of the same ilk as that uh, display system objects kind of, yeah. 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 Yeah, it's, uh, it's like a, you know, death by a thousand paper cuts kind of a thing. So. Yeah, if you have prior art, then I absolutely encourage you to put it up. Like, that would be... That would be great, but I don't think we can. I don't think we can go after them w like just with the prior art and, and get rid of the patents. Like we would need to. There would have to be. Yeah, there'd have to be an opportunity. So. Yeah. Well, and the thing about Android too is that some is hardware and some is software. So like some of the. Because the software stuff, like, if they don't have the software stuff, so sometimes they'll sue on the hardware. And then we're, we're working more particularly with the software patents and not with the hardware patents. So, like, so we, they're not. Okay. So, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, it's uh, like the ones that get settled. It's 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 hard to know what happened there. And a lot of times, like a um, condition of settling is uh, that they will not talk about it. So like it's it's one of the things that um, I always get asked about OIN is like, oh, so who have you helped and how did it work? And like most of the time, I'm like, I'm not allowed to discuss any. Of yeah, because that was the terms of settling. So, um, you know, that's that's difficult. Um, and and I think that you know, like, unfortunately, that works to the advantage of like the wealthier litigant uh, in that sense to be like, ooh, I use some scary stuff over here. You won't know what it is until I come for you, sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. There's um Well, oh yeah, well, perhaps. Um, right, so we are able to help folks who are members. Um, yeah, and it's, I mean, you know, as the, as the number of OIN members grows and the number of patents that are in that pool in the Linux system definition expands, like, you know, we may start to look like a less tempting target. Like, oh, when you see them, like, oh, they always like crowdsource all the prior art, and then you settle, and it's like just a big, you know, we paid lawyers for nothing. We didn't even get a good lawsuit out of it, and it's like so. Th you know, um, I mean, I think we'd have to be a little bit bigger to be that scary. Um, you know, to to not to de deflect suits from that in that way. But um, yeah, I mean. Anyone can be an OIN member as long as they agree to not sue other folks in the pool and not use those patents to uh, troll or aggress. So it's it's not like but a. So well, no, um, actually, no. Lots of our members didn't contribute any patents to the pool, um, and you don't you don't need to. If you did have patents in that area, then you know we'd have to talk about like, are you putting them in the pool? Because if you're not, that's weird. Like, why are you? Why do you want access to everybody else's patents and you're not putting yours in the pool? So, um, 
so we wouldn't be down with that. But uh, yeah, you don't have to have patents to uh, be part of the pool. And I'm getting the 30 second, and I'm, I'll be here, and you can, we can you know talk more afterwards. But uh, thank you so much, and thanks for the like the awesome questions. So. Oh, okay, yeah. Sorry, I don't need to be on there. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption, I think. When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up, uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then, as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack, as a project, is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. 
Add on seeing your limits with the clouds tag. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisks. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler, faster, and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.